early on being a Newcastle fan, but not a bad start to the season, I think everybody would agree. Anyway, my name is David Fishwick. Um, unfortunately, I have to leave straight after I finish, but I am absolutely a delighted and honoured to have been invited to talk uh, with you, but also very happy also to take emails or queries in relation to anything that I talk about. Um, this is a subject close to my heart because I am a chest doctor. I just sit in clinic week in, week out in the NHS. And it would be wrong of me to sort of say to you that I see just silicosis and nothing else. Of course I don't. I, I see lots of other breathing problems. But I think silicosis is still an issue for doctors like me. And I will talk on a couple of tragic stories. These are all tragedies in my view as a practicing doctor when you see people where things perhaps could have turned out differently um, if things have been done at an earlier stage in their workplace. And that's why I'm absolutely delighted that everybody is here today to consider these issues. A couple of really pretty black and white photos. I'm going to talk about each of those. One of those is the ultra structure of the lung. And the second is the scene of a complete and utter tragedy in the United States about uh, 80 years ago. So there they are. There are your lungs. You've got two, hopefully. I suspect it's very unlikely you've got uh, more than two. Yeah, I suppose you might have one. If you've had a lung taken out, you may just have had one from birth. But generally, we are given these precious things. I would be absolutely made up if at the end of this talk, when I show you this picture again, that signifies this is the end of this talk, that you think slightly differently about these lungs. That is actually a model of a real set of human lungs. So when someone has died and consented to give their body to medical science, uh, a polymer is poured into their lungs. This is a polymeric cast of the human lung. So, you know, unlike sort of cartoon images where the lungs are sort of balloons full of air, um, your lungs are anything but that. You can see on the picture on the right that they are beautiful, fragile, tree-like, and they branch and branch and branch and branch in order, and you can probably remember from your biology, in order to allow the oxygen that's in this room effectively to get into the, the bloodstream. Now that picture on the left I think is really, really interesting. You're all much more technically minded than I am. And that is a picture of the human alveolus. You have about 300 million of those in every lung. And they are about 70 microns across. 70 to about 200 microns across. That little membrane that you can see there holds your blood from your heart and the big open space that you see there uh, is connected to the great outdoors. So, all of you in this room and me are a micron away from bleeding to death every moment of your life. Now, if you had a piece of machinery in the workplace that you are relying on, which had a micron thin membrane, uh, to, to function well, you would be very keen on its maintenance contract. You would be very keen on an annual look at it. You'd be saying, how are we going to maintain this? Very important. And yet your, your lungs and the workers within working environments have exactly that. This is a precious resource that we are given and, in my view, should be looked after. So I'm going to talk firstly about silicosis. Um, obviously, silica is the main um, deliberation today. Um, and there are countries in the world, this is from Kazakhstan, where silicosis destroys, completely destroys families. Generations of men die from silicosis. Women who work in mines and or get environmental exposure from silica also succumb, as occasionally do children. So we're in a very difficult and different, sorry, a different situation in the UK. Now, I've started off by doing loads of talking, so here's the fantastic opportunity to get to know your next-door neighbour. I'm going to give you a minute. How many normal breaths do you think you take in a lifetime? So, if you don't know your next-door neighbour, now's a fantastic opportunity. I'll give you a minute, and here are the options. 12 million, 90 million, 440 million, or 900 million. Off you go. No calculators, no phone a friend, no 50-50.
All right, so um, what am I bid? Um, I feel like I should be in an auction here, so what am I bid for the top blue line? 12 million, that's a very large number of breaths. I mean, that's, if you were requiring a piece of machinery to do that in your workplace 12 million times in its lifetime, you would be very keen to look after it. So anyone still there? Anyone still awake? How about 12 million? No. Okay, what about uh, 90 million? That's a very, very large number by any stretch. No? Anybody wishing to vote? What about 440 million? There are definitely some people voting now. That's fantastic. What about 900 million? Fantastic. So um, I'm preaching to the converted. Don't shoot the messenger. But I suspect the answer is approximately 440 million. Give yourselves a big clap if you got it right. And if you don't, we'll giggle at you, shall we? All right. But the... I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that the lungs that you are given at birth have got to last an awfully long time. They have to do an awful lot of good work for you. And I know there are very young individuals in the audience who are thinking, what is he talking about? But I can tell you, with the um, benefit of a bit of age, is that I see young individuals in clinic where they think about every breath. Um, I have taken about... 3,000 breaths this morning since I got out of bed. I've got young kids, I live in Sheffield, I came down this morning. I haven't thought about any single one of those. When you get silicosis or you get breathing problems related to work, patients think about every single one of those. So I guess the point is there's lots of influences on your lung health. Um, smoking is one that you might think about, viral infections, and workplaces are a really important consideration. I know you're um, signed up to that issue because you're here. When you add all that um, air up, that's a very considerable number of meters cubed that you're taking into your lungs over your lifetime. You can see where I'm going with this. About a third of that you breathe in in bed, a third of it you breathe in at work, and a third you breathe in when you're doing the stuff you really want to do, I guess, uh, in hobbies and so on. If you took a walk out into the car park for 63 metres, and then you took a right angle bend and walked another 63 metres, and then got into a helicopter and went up 63 metres, that is one big cube. And that's the amount of air that you breathe in over a lifetime. So the quality of that air is so important to all of us if you are going to rely on your lungs when you're 80 or 90 uh, to sustain you appropriately. Now, have a quick look up the, your next door neighbor's nose. I know it's a slightly unusual situation. I, it's true, it's, it's for real. Have a quick look up your nose. I'm gonna give you a couple of seconds to do that. I can't believe it, this guy's crazy. Okay, so um, what you will see, and I won't ask you to tell me what you see because I might not get what I want, but basically what you see are thick brush-like hairs. And you are given that defense, you are already given that for free. So workers who are exposed to respirable crystalline silica or any form of dust already have these really thick brush-like hairs at the front of their nose and the anterior nares. But you can imagine that silica is a slightly different situation because we're talking about very fine dust. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. So the, the big brushy-like hairs that you see at the front there aren't particularly helpful for that type of exposure. If you go into the back of the nose, and I'm not suggesting we now, we now do that, but you take a biopsy, and this is a scanning electron microscopy, another beautiful image. This is part of us. Um, when you start to look in detail, humans are fragile and just beautiful in terms of you know, the images we get out of ourselves. You see this absolutely fine network of hairs in the back of the nose, and they go all the way down into your lungs. And they're there for a particular reason. These little cilia waft gently all the time. So we're already equipped with fantastic mechanisms to help us get rid of muck and dust and dirt, and silica is no exception to this when we breathe it in to allow us to get this dust out of our lungs and begin to get it up. And we get it up to the back of the throat, and then our normal cough reflex coughs it up. Hence why if you go into a dusty environment, you may start feeling a little uh, short of breath or wheezy, but you bring up this dust at the back of your throat and then the lungs will cough it up ordinarily. So a fantastic set of, um, of little hairs that do their job. 
interestingly, and I am definitely not here to talk about the dangers of smoking, although you would appreciate I see a lot of um, smoking-related ill health, one, one drag on a cigarette um, <clears throat> pretty much knocks those cilia to sleep. So it, it is known, for example, that if you take one puff on a cigarette, that that will very significantly interfere with cilia. And that's probably why people who smoke get more infections in their chest, or part of the reason, than those who, who don't. So these are the alveoli, and you're also given massively important defense systems in the alveoli. These are the little babies, the little fellows that are keeping us all alive currently. And down in this part, this is where silica gets into the lungs. Um, you have little cells that help eat and engulf and sort of eat things away uh, that get down that far. But like any system, any system that you have in your workplace, it, it's only good up until a, a point. So if you push a system, it will eventually squeal and stop working. And that is exactly what happens with silica when workers are exposed over a number of years. The lungs just cannot cope eventually using these two types of defense that I've talked about already. And it's when you flood the system that people start to get problems with their breathing. And that's why it's so important to think about exposures, particularly to things like silica, because once they get down there, some of these are very difficult to rid from the, from the lungs. Now, I just thought out of interest, you might be interested in the, the, the size of these, the, these, these issues. That's the human hair on the left-hand side, massively, massively, massively magnified. But it, it's a really useful comparison, because we all have hair, or most of you, I suspect, have hair. But you can see that there is a huge magnification here. And human hair is about 50 millionths of a metre across. And then if you look at the photograph on the right-hand side, that's um, silica. That's what we're all here. That's what the pledge is all about. That's what you are all focusing on now and thinking about and exercising your minds about. And you can see, and I've tried to reduce the size of the picture to, to give it some form of size comparison. But that's the size of the um, dust that you're talking about. So the first thing to say is it's microscopic, um, invisible, difficult to see. And that's, uh, in a sense, a problem for you. Because it isn't the dust that you're necessarily seeing in workplaces which may harm you. It's the dust which is tiny, tiny, tiny and microscopic. Um, much tinier than a human hair, which is the stuff that gets right down into the business part of the, of the lungs. So you can begin to see, as we weave on through the introduction, that if you introduce silica like that on the right-hand side to the lungs on the left-hand side, you can begin to understand with this beautiful micron-thin membrane that's keeping us all alive, you know better than I if you freshly fracture silica. Uh, an example might be a stonemason who's cutting through using a dry cutting technique, freshly cutting through rock with a high silica content. You can begin to understand that you've got a sort of knife, jaggedy sort of sharp stuff. And when you inhale that, you can begin to understand that when it sticks and penetrates into that most beautiful part, but the fragile part of the lung, that is where the problem of silicosis starts. Because you just flood that system, and it's very difficult to go backwards from that particular point. Now, I've got three um, medical slides. The, the third one, if you haven't had your breakfast and you don't like squeamish photographs, I'll tell you to look away. But this one's, this, I think this one's fairly all right, isn't it? This is a picture of um, the inside of the lungs taken at biopsy. And the stuff on the left-hand side is normal. And that's the big holes there are the alveoli again. This is just under a microscope now. And you can see that the, the walls are nice and thin. It's allowing the oxygen to get from the room that we're all in now into the bloodstream. If you look at the picture on the right-hand side there, you see that they're all stuffed with stuff. Those little thin areas have been massively expanded out. And, and that is a biopsy taken from somebody with silicosis. I'll just check if the laser works. Yeah, there we go. I apologize if you can't see from over here. But these areas here are massively expanded, and that's because the inflammation has started to work in the lung. So once those bits of silica get stuck down there, they start to cause an inflammation in the lung. And that's very clearly seen on that biopsy. 
Again, this is uh, another example. I don't know if anybody else um, would want to r um, risk ridicule in front of 200 people and have a guess at what that might be. I can tell you it's the same, it's a biopsy. Um, there's black material in there. Anybody, any idea what that might be? Smoker's lung. Smoker's lung, yeah, it could be, absolutely could be smoker's lung. Fantastic answer. This is actually an occupational biopsy, so thinking laterally, what's black that some people Coal, absolutely. So this is coal aggreg aggregated in the lung. And you can see again, <clears throat> a beautiful, but not beautiful if you happen to be the patient, of course, example of uh, coal uh, aggregations in the lung. So when you look at biopsies, you see this stuff down in people's lungs. So some of this just can't get out. And when you look, and this is the photograph, if you're not particularly keen on seeing whole lung, it's a post-mortem specimen. There's no dead body or anything. It's just a lung. You've probably seen it before, so if you don't want to look, please do look away now. And there is a section of whole lung, and that is, uh, you can see at the left-hand side, nice, normal, healthy pink lung. That's what your lungs look like. They don't look like balloons. They look like sponges, as we've talked about already. And you see that huge black hole at the top of that lung. And that was from somebody who died of silicosis. So you can see the potential damage that something like silica can do when it starts to penetrate down deep into the lung area. OK, so far so good. What does that actually mean in real life? I haven't really talked about people yet, just talked about your lungs. So I see, as I mentioned earlier, people with silicosis. It's not common, but I do see a fairly regular stream of individuals coming into clinic. And here's one of them. Uh, this guy was 46, not particularly um, special case of silicosis. This is just a case of silicosis. Um, he had never smoked in his life, came up to clinic with his wife. And he had just noticed they had a little uh, grandchild that he was short of breath when he was kicking the football around the park with him. That was about it. He um, had been a stonemason all his working life. Um, since he was 20, he was so 46 years worth of exposure, and um, he had some tests, and we did some tests on him. Now, I know that some of you are already going through the process of thinking about how to approach health surveillance in the workplace, and they are pretty similar to the tests that we would be doing in a hospital. But I'll show you his x ray and I'll show you his CT scan, just so you can get a flavour, a feel for what it actually looks like in reality to see images from people who've got silicosis. Now, there's a lot talked about macho culture at work and um, very difficult to tackle that, and I totally understand that, but there's nothing macho about having a conversation with me, with your wife present, in tears, both of them in relation to this diagnosis. So finally, when it comes to it, there's nothing macho about this condition at all, I can absolutely assure you. Here's his chest x-ray, and I think the lights are going to prevent you having a look at it in any great detail, but you can see the heart in the middle there. And right at the top, oh, thank, thanks, Sue, that's fantastic. <clears throat> right at the top, this is the heart here, you can see gas in the tummy there, stomach from breakfast, and you can see lots of little white dots, and they are absolutely typical of the damage that you see in silicosis. But you're all saying, well, it's a bit sort of difficult to see, and I agree with you, it is really difficult to see. Um, so that's why you put patients through the equivalent of the bacon slicer, and there's the bacon slicer, that's a CT scan, and you can immediately see, you see a hugely different layer of detail. Yep. And here <clears throat> is the windpipe. These are the lungs either side, and you can see here a huge lump of chalk, effectively. And here, the white scarring, which is absolutely typical of silicosis. Now, you don't need to be a chest doctor to understand that that is going to make breathing uh, very challenging for patients like this. And this is the sort of reality of my job, seeing people like this. You're right at the other end of this spectrum where you're working with something that has the potential to do this, but it's in your gift as to whether or not you are exposing people or exposing yourself to something that may do this. So, um, was he just unlucky? I I'm really interested in your views about this. Was he just the unlucky man in that stone yard? Or what do you think his risk actually 
because he'd done 26 years of work with silica. What was his actual risk of doing that? So please, just spend 30 seconds with your next door neighbour. Is it one in a thousand, one in a hundred, one in 40, or one in 20? I'll give you 30 seconds, just have a little thing. Right, so um, I'm sure I can hear f chat about the football. <laughs> um, what, what do people think? Was he just unlucky? What about a one in a thousand risk? Anybody willing to commit to that in front of your colleagues? Okay, what about a one in a hundred? That's still quite a significant risk. Yes, lady here. Um, few hands going up, and that, that's, I think, a very reasonable um, vote. What about a one in 40 risk? Okay, so quite significant risk now we're talking, and one in 20, really very high risk. Okay, and again, don't shoot the messenger. I've got a fast car waiting. Half marks for one in 40 or one in 20. But to be honest, one in 100 I would also accept. And this is the problem, that whichever set of risks you look at, you tend to get different, different answers. But broadly speaking, there is a consensus. In your line of work, you will, get, you will develop in your workplaces a consensus view if people have differing views. And this is exactly what the medical and silica interested community do. And you will probably be more aware than me of the OSHA document from the United States recently, which has started to look at those risks. But I think the point is from these pictures, not the numbers, is just that this is not a tiny risk. This is quite a significant risk over a lifetime. Now these OSHA data are 45 years of exposure, so that's a long working lifetime actually, so you can take the numbers affected down. But even so, this slide is half our current well, 0 0.05 milligrams per metre cubed. You will be familiar with the 0.1 value. And you can see that at 45 years, you've got about a 5% lifetime risk. You have to drop it down to a quarter of our current well to get it down to very low levels, for example. And if you do the opposite and come up to our current well, now, this is associated with a very significant risk, but you mustn't forget this is over 45 years of exposure rather than some of the risks that will be quoted in the industry in relation to 15 or 20 years of exposure. And that the exposure doesn't just go up with risk in a line. As you get more exposure, your risks start to really escalate up. Why is that? Probably because if you have silicosis and you already have a damaged lung, more silica is able to even more damage the lung because the lung is already damaged. So that's why the risk probably doesn't go up in a linear fashion, but goes up in an exponential way. Nevertheless, the take-home message is the risks are finite and real for people like me and for people like yourselves. Oops, apologise about that, seems to have gone wrong a little bit. Um, it's not so important, it's just to make the point that if you go looking in international studies, this happens to be a Dutch study, but actually some of you will be familiar, the Dutch have done a lot of work on silica, particularly in the construction sector, and the values that you can't see hidden behind the chest X-ray, CT scan image are that if you go looking in workplaces you will find abnormalities. And depending on what type of abnormality on a chest x-ray you're looking for in your workers, you will find quite significant numbers of people who've been exposed a lot who will go on and develop silicosis. So when you start x-raying people, you will find people with problems. So generally quoted are these figures, about 2.5% to 10% over a lifetime, um, 20 years working life uh, at the current well. Um, we had a meeting last week with some representatives in the BCC where we went through things in a, a lot more detail. And to summarise, it is a very complicated area and I have a lot of sympathy for work sites and um, trade associations who are now grappling with these issues of silica once again. I know you do a lot of fantastic work in this area and as I said, if there's anything I can do to help, I would be more than happy to assist you trying to come to terms with some of these quite complicated medical information. 
Now, I know you've seen this slide load, so I, I don't want to sort of say it's only a small pile of silica dust, but that is the amount that you need to breathe in. But my point in the slide is slightly different. If you take a third of that little pile there and put it into a meter cube, that's broadly the concentration you're looking at over a working shift. A worker will roughly breathe in about 2.4 meters cubed of air in a working day. That's the pile for the whole working day. So this is invisible. That is why you're paying, I, I suspect, consultants and hygienists to take measures or to look at your processes to ensure that you're uh, reducing your exposures where you possibly can do. You get the theme now, aren't you? It's a bit like who wants to be a millionaire, isn't it? So I'm now interested in your view about who gets silicosis. And I, I just want you to spend just maybe 30 seconds thinking about the age profile. So silicosis is never seen, never, under the age of 58, 48, 38, or 28. So again, have a, have a quick chat with your next door neighbor. All right, every, every question is asked for a reason, isn't it? So, um, what about, um, what am I bid for? Um, let's go with 58, we'll start from the bottom up. Anybody think, you, you, you hardly ever see this in younger individuals. I'm 55 next, so sort of my age and older. Okay, what about 48? You know the case I showed you was 46, so by default, that first one has got to be incorrect, yeah? Because it happened. <laughs> what about 38 years old? That's um, by, my by my age, anyway, very young. Yeah, one hand, someone scratching the nose, about 28, that's pretty young. Okay, so, okay, that's fair. I think that's a very reasonable answer. Of course, uh, I asked it because there's, none of those are correct, and um, the data just so happens there are some UK data. These are Scottish x-rays, I should say, of Scottish stonemasons. Now, I don't expect you to be expert at looking at the x-rays, but you've already seen a few. So I can point to the abnormal bits, but you're probably already honing your skills a little bit here. This is a 24-year-old man with shadowing in his lungs. This is a 29-year-old man with extensive shadowing in his lungs. Uh, again, this person here is 37 with extensive shadowing in the lungs. And these were written up by one of my colleagues, a chest doctor in Edinburgh, Peter Reed, in relation to a Scottish stonemason experience. Now, I don't know the ins and outs of this, and I suspect that these individuals were not exposed at the current well, but they would have been exposed much at, to much greater concentrations. But the point is, this is not just a disease of old people like me. It is a disease of younger individuals too. And you, it's in, within your gift to ensure that younger individuals are protected just like older individuals are in the workplace. And I was shocked to see this in terms of the, the age profile. And actually, this little fellow would tell you a story. Um, although he lives in uh, Pakistan, he has got an x-ray on the right-hand side. And he is seven. And he has silicosis. And he wasn't working down the mines, but his mum and dad were. And it was thought that there was really heavy contamination of the, uh, the home environment with silica dust over a number of years. And in fact, he developed a complication of silicosis called silicotuberculosis, TB, um, and survived, luckily. But you can see that his x-ray, I would not like my 11-year-old son to have an x-ray looking like that. So please don't, don't compartmentalize silicosis as being a disease of people who are retired, because that is not the case. All right, so I'm, I've got about nine minutes left. I'm just going to run through some examples of um, unusual scenarios which may be interesting for you. Just to, again, hang the ideas that we've already developed around, you only get two lungs, your lungs are important. There are many influences on your lungs and things can go wrong. And I'll show just some quick examples 
of how things can go wrong. I'm not suggesting that this is what's happening in your workplaces, but hopefully they may be interesting to you to um, appreciate what happens if you are um, not careful with exposures. <clears throat> this is a photograph of a bored tunnel um, through a, a mountain in West Virginia. It was bored through in 1920, and this is called the Hawk's Nest Tragedy. Um, some of you will be familiar with it. Um, complete and utter preventable disaster. A thousand men started off um, drilling this tunnel out, and they did it to divert water in a hydroelectric system. And effectively what happened was they were drilling through low um, silica containing rock, and then they hit a, silica, a high silica containing seam, and unfortunately you understand what happened next. Over the period of about the next uh, few months to a year, 600 of those men died. Uh, some of them died acutely, literally over a few days and some died over a few months and years. Um, there's a plaque there, I have been there, there's a plaque there to commemorate this, this, and only in 1980 were all the bodies finally exhumed and put to proper rest. So if ever you want an example of how not to do things, um, this put down this cold 600 young fit men who were drilling through a mountainside in West Virginia. So silica is bad for you, there is no doubt about that. Now the exposures here I think would have been astronomically, astronomically high. And, uh, you know, the reason for this is that rocks, and you know, gosh, you know this much better than me, I'm a chest doctor, but this is your bread and butter, that rocks contain different um, silica contents, but it's, it's an issue around raw materials, understanding your raw materials, understanding where your hazards are in the workplace, and how you can look at those risks and those mitigate those risks, of course. And you'll all have fantastic ways of doing this. And, you know, I'm absolutely delighted speaking to Bud earlier that this pledge has been, and hearing what Stephen's saying, 15 years worth of activity. I'm delighted you're focusing on this really important issue. You're beginning to get the point now, that, um, and this CT scan that you can see at the bottom is clearly, and you've probably seen a few now, enough to know, very, very abnormal. And uh, lots of white dots in the lung, and this is silicoproteinosis. And this occurred in a group of Brazilian um, sandblasters who were using sand to blast off um, a, a covering on a, on, a, on a piece of stone. It occurred over a few years, and many individuals were involved in, the, in this. Now, there were some numbers associated with this. I'll give you the first one, because I'm a charitable sort of person. There we go. There were 13 individuals. But um, as a final who wants to be a millionaire, I just want you to spend a couple of moments deliberating what you think those other numbers stand for. So I'll give you about 20 seconds or so. All right, so anybody brave enough to say what they think 44 is in this, um, this, this tragedy in relation to Brazilian stone bla uh, sandblasters? Anybody, any, um, any thoughts? Sorry? 44 employees, yeah, could have been. It could have been 13 out of 44. Absolutely bang on. It wasn't that, but it could well have been that. The oldest age. The oldest age. If I had a prize, I would give you that prize. So that was the eldest age of the man who was involved. Uh, in, this, uh, in this series of 13 individuals. What about 18? 18 smokers, not the case, but it could have been? Youngest. Youngest. So there was an 18-year-old man who was involved in this situation. And three? Yes. Deaths, absolutely, yeah. So three of 13 uh, died in this scenario. So the point I'm making is this can potentially be exceedingly bad for you. Pretty much... Um, Penultimately, in terms of the examples, and then I will finish, um, you will be aware of the story that relates to um, the Turkish sandblasters, and they were sandblasting denim cloth. So denim cloth from Nîmes originally in France, we all wear it, we're not probably wearing it today, but um, when our kids buy it now, it's all sandblasted and uh, faded for, you know, sort of fashion requirement. Uh, it looks very attractive cloth, but it's done, or was done, using uh, sand. 
And effectively in Turkey, you can see that this is what this, this worker is doing. This, this photograph was actually taken at the workplace where there was an outbreak of silicosis. Not surprisingly, look at the state of the art respiratory protection this guy's using, you know, sort of an old rag around his face. And you can just look at the, um, the work situation here. It's just not surprising, is it, that that hazard turned into a massive risk for this set of uh, individuals. A few of these men died. Um, again, so there's a recurrent story developing in relation to how bad silica is for you. Some of these needed lung transplantation. And um, just out of interest, heart transplantation is phenomenally successful. Maybe one of you in the audience has had a heart transplant. Lung transplantation is still very experimental. You have about a 70% chance of being alive after a year, so about a 30% chance of being dead after a lung transplant. So some of these were transplanted, but it is not just a straightforward issue. So the horrific situation of the Egyptian sandblasters. And pretty much um, finally, in terms of um, example, this is the numbers of silicosis that were um, attributed to a new type of exposure. And I don't know if anybody happens to know what it is, but I can tell you the bottom axis starts in 1997 uh, and it finishes in 2010. And you can see there was virtually none of it and then over the last few years, there's been an awful lot of it reported in relation to a particular type of exposure to silica, which is in a new environment. Just making the point, you've got to be constantly vigilant about how these exposures are interacting with humans. Anybody happen to know what's the scenario here? Chip manufacturer. Sorry? Chip manufacturer. Chip manufacturer. No, not, but it could. I'm, I, I know not so much about it, but not, not no. This is a particular type of um, fitment in a house, just to give you a clue. Artex, air conditioning, all very good ideas, but not. Um, in your kitchen? Yeah, exactly. So granite, and indeed not granite, but synthetic engineered stone worktops. So these are now made in Spain and Israel, and very, very attractive. They can be coloured to the customer's requirements. And the point I'm making is, as technology moves on, so potentially does the same hazard appear in different scenarios. And what happened here was that you can see a cutting saw through an engineered stone product. They're very easy to cut in comparison to granite, and very expensive, and they have resins within them, but also very high silica content. And this was the Israeli experience. And again, some men died. Uh, others have required lung transplantation. And you can see there one of the x-rays, all the dots that you're now totally familiar with, in relation to the diagnosis in this group of people. And there's another of these unfortunate Israeli kitchen top manufacturers with silicosis. And this is not just the risk of people making this stuff. This is a risk also of people who fit this in people's homes because it has to be cut a bit like corian or granite to go into a particular bespoke space. And when you actually look at the silica content of some of these newer agents, you, you, you can read the data there. You don't need me to explain to you how, um, how damaging and potentially these could be given their silica content. So I was going to go on and talk about coal, but it's 10 o'clock. Um, I think I hopefully have um, highlighted a few issues in relation to respiratory health. And by way of Summary, really. Uh, th think about those two lungs in your chest. They are absolutely amazing. They are unique to you. And it's very unlikely you'll ever get another one. Um, they are so important in your longevity and also in your enjoyment of life, um, perhaps in the years after you leave work. And I suspect all of you in this room are totally signed up to the view that your actions now actually will def definitely will shape the future health of your lungs and also of workers within your work environment. So thank you for being such an attentive audience. Thank you very much indeed.